Good morning, everyone, and welcome back. Today we are in week three of a short three-week message series called It Hits Different. And this message series is all about how to experience the Bible. Uh, whether, uh, whether you are opening it up for the first time, maybe a little intimidated, or whether you are a seasoned uh, student of the Bible, I really hope and pray that through this this short three-week series, that there would be some dots connecting uh, for each person, wherever you are, to help you take steps in the direction of uh, reading, understanding, and applying the Bible better and better. In the first week, we learned that, that all of Scripture is inspired by God, okay? That it, that it is accurate and can be trusted. Uh, in week two, we learned that it's really important as we read the Bible to read it in context, to understand what's being said, by whom, to whom, where in the larger story we are, so that we can and properly apply it to our lives and not take things out of context. Today, as we close out this message series, I want to talk specifically about this question, how do I get something out of the text? And so today we're actually going to walk through some passages in the Bible, and we're going to just do it really slowly. And I'm going to show you today um, how to study the Bible for yourself, and I hope that this is going to be helpful. Uh, we have uh, these two words that we've been kind of talking about through the series, technique and posture. Technique is the how. It's the, it's the what we're doing with the scriptures as we're trying to understand it and read it. But then uh, posture is so, so important because posture is what we do with it. And it doesn't matter how well you know the Bible if you don't apply it to your life. And so we're talking about both technique and posture. And today we're going to start with, we're going to start with technique. And at the end, we're going to talk a little bit about posture. So if you're new to reading and studying the Bible for yourself, I, I want to share with you uh, an approach, a way that you can read the Bible, and it's called the inductive approach. Uh, the inductive approach is simple, four steps that I'm going to share with you, and then we're going to practice it together. These four steps will help you to read and understand the Bible. Can you imagine what step one might be? Uh, if you were here for last week, then you'll know step one is context, context, context. We need to know where in the storyline, the arc of the story of the Bible we are, who's speaking, what kind of document. We said this last week, the Bible is a compilation of a whole bunch of documents and books, including history, poetry, dialogue, letters, all of these things are in here. And so you need to know what you're reading so that you know how to read it properly. So context, we're going we're to practice that today. The second step is observation. Uh, sometimes we want to grab a Bible verse and figure out what it means right away, and I would just encourage you to practice observation. Just look at the text, maybe read it a few times, and go, what stands out? Is there anything unusual? Are there themes? Are there words repeating over and over again that might have significance? Uh, is there something here that's out of the ordinary, that, that grabs your attention? This is what we want to do in the second step. We'll call it observation. Step number three is meaning. This is where we try to figure out what exactly does the story or the verse or the thing being said in the Bible, what does it actually mean? What's underneath it? Uh, and then lastly, this is really important, lastly, we want to apply it. So we have application last. We want to be able to take what we're reading and the meaning behind it and then apply it to our lives. We learned this last week. If we read the word, but we don't do it, this is not much use. It's really silly to do that. So we want to make sure that whatever we're reading from the Bible that we can then apply into our lives. So I do have a, uh, a little short form uh, for these four steps. Uh, the first letter from each word spells coma, which uh, many of you, when you open the Bible, it feels like you're going into one. So maybe that will help you to remember it. We have context, observation, meaning, and then application. So this morning, I want to actually walk through a, a, series of, a series of passages together that are found in Genesis chapter 3. Now, before we actually read those passages and look at them, uh, what do we need to do? The first thing we need to do is consider context. I shared with you last week one of the easiest ways to discover the context of a passage is actually to go to the beginning of that book. If you have a physical Bible, or even online, there'll be a summary, and there's this, I got a little paragraph here at the beginning of Genesis that gives me some context about the document that I'm reading. Genesis contains the creation account, the fall of man, that's what we're going to be reading today in Genesis 3, and then it has the story of, of Adam and Eve's children, and then on to Noah, and, and Abraham, and some of the patriarchs. So all of this is in Genesis. Uh, if you read that little paragraph, in my Bible, it tells me that uh, it tells me that this book, Genesis, which means beginnings, uh, 
was most likely, many scholars believe that it was written by Moses at the time of the Exodus. And the first five books are called the books of Moses. Uh, this is very likely to be true. We can't verify that, but that all gives you a bit of context for where we are. Now, before we read, I want to show you, this is the little graph I showed you last week that shows the acts of the Bible. We have creation, the fall, the nation of Israel, Jesus, the church, and then the consummation. And so Genesis 3 falls here in the storyline, okay? Uh, after creation, and we're actually going to see the fall take place as we read in Genesis 3 today. So that frames where and what we're reading, and now we're going to observe. That's the second step. So we have context and then observation. Let's jump into the text. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. It says, The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? So, let's observe together. What do you see? Anything jumping out at you? Uh, there should be a few things that jump out at you. Is there anything here that's odd or out of the ordinary? Uh, I would say yes. Let me show you some of the things that I noticed. First of all, we have a serpent or a snake. Okay? Not that unusual. The serpent is called shrewd, which is um, cunning in a, in a negative way. Okay, so you get this cunning, deceitful, shrewd serpent, okay? Not, and it's the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. And then it says, one day he, the serpent, asked the woman a question. Now this should throw up a red flag for you. Uh, if you've never read the Bible, you might be like, okay, this is why I don't read the Bible, because there's talking snakes. And you're immediately going to be wondering, okay, was this, a, was this a, a real snake? Some people believe that, you know, before the fall, serpents could talk, I guess. Uh, but other people would say, oh, this is just like a myth and a legend that teaches the truth. I, don't, I wouldn't go in either of those directions. It says the serpent was the shrewdest, and he asked the woman a question. So let's think about this through the lens of, of context for just a moment. Remember what I already told you? This book, very likely written by Moses at the time of the Exodus. Uh, most of you, even if you're not um, completely studied in, in Egyptian history, you've probably seen Egyptian hieroglyphs and uh, drawings uh, from Egypt, and you see, these, um, you see these human bodies with animal heads. And these represent some of the deities and gods at the time uh, of Egypt. And this would be the context and the time period in which this was written. So I want you to imagine for a second, um, when we think about ancient peoples, you know, four or five, six thousand years ago, we often think that they were just not very intelligent. Like they would just believe that snakes were talking. But in reality, in reality, uh, the Egyptian people and the people at that time often, often uh, pictured spiritual creatures, deities, and gods, and connected them with animals. Not that they believed that the gods were an animal, but rather, rather that those animals had qualities or characteristics that defined those gods. So this is really interesting. An ancient person and the ancient Jews who were coming out of Egypt would have read this story and went, okay, hang on a second. There is some sort of spiritual creature that is being represented as a snake that is speaking and we know something about that, 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 that spirit being's a nature because it is shrewd. And he asked the woman a question. So this is putting things into context. And if you think I'm crazy about what I'm saying, um, I was looking in my Bible, and I have a study Bible. Maybe some of you do. And in Genesis 3, verse 1, where it says, the serpent, there's a little tiny letter. And if I go over to the margin of my Bible, it directs me to Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, which says this. John the Apostle is writing in the final book of the Bible about what's going to come in the future, the end of time. And he says, the great dragon was thrown down, the ancient serpent. And he's connecting what happened in the garden to a specific spiritual creature who is called the devil and Satan. That's how we know him. The deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth. So let's... Let's take all that into context and let's look at the rest of the statement. So we got Satan, the devil, and he's shrewd and he's asking a question to Eve and here's what he asks. Did God really say you must not eat the fruit? I highlighted fruit because you're going to see that's a theme through all of this. Did he really say you must not eat the fruit of any of the trees? I highlighted this because any of the trees, it's like, 
did he say you couldn't eat any of the trees? That's not what he said. He's, he's casting doubt. So, so now we've observed, and maybe you found some different things in the text, but let me ask you a question. What's the meaning? Is there a truth underneath this? And I'll, I'll propose one to you here, that Satan plants seeds of mistrust in God. If you want to know how Satan is working in this world, he does this. He plants seeds of mistrust. Did God really say that? Did God really mean that? Is that, is that really what you're supposed to do? Let's continue on. Uh, it says this, of course we may eat the fruit, she replies, of the trees in the garden. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. So what are you noticing about the text? Is there anything that's jumping out to you as you look at it? Well, let me show you a few of the things that I've highlighted. Again, we see the fruit is the center of the conversation. The woman says, it's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden, not all the trees. God said, you must not eat it, and I highlighted this, or even touch it. I highlighted this because in the previous chapter... Remember, when you want to read something in context, you read what comes before and after. In the previous chapter, God creates Adam and says, don't eat of the tree. There's no mention of touching it, which obviously shows us that we like to add rules to what God has already commanded us. So as we look at all this, what might the, the meaning underneath it all, what can we learn from it? Um, here's, here's an idea for you to consider. Mistrust happens around the one restriction. They could do anything, but the one thing they were told not to touch it caused them to begin to mistrust God and his intentions. Satan says, you won't die, the serpent replies. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. What do you see in here? Take a look at the words. What jumps out at you? Here are a few of the suggestions uh, that I outlined. First, this is an outright lie. You won't die. What he... he should have said in brackets, you won't die right away. That might have been true. Uh, but definitely they would die because of what they did. And the serpent says, God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it and you will be like God. So what's the meaning behind this? What is Satan trying to communicate in this? I, I think it would look something like this. God is holding out on you. He doesn't want you to have that because that will be good for you and he doesn't want good for you. You should be in charge of your own life. That's the underlying message. And as we continue in our text, this is the woman was convinced. She saw the tree was beautiful and that its fruit looked delicious and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it and then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. Take a look at it. What are you noticing? Anything jump out and anything seem out of place? Let's take a look at some of the words I've highlighted. The woman was convinced. Something shifted. She made a decision to do this thing. We see the fruit once again uh, showing up in the text. It's a, a centerpiece. She wanted the wisdom it would give her. There was something that she believed God was holding back from her that she wanted. And I noted this here that her husband was with her. We often think and picture Eve by herself talking to the snake, eating, and then bringing the fruit to her husband. But in fact, it tells us that he was right there the whole time. Here's the, here's the last passage. It says, At that moment their eyes were opened. They suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together and covered themselves. What do you notice about the text? What are you seeing? Here are a few things that I pulled out of the text. Their eyes were opened and they suddenly felt shame. Something significant has shifted. And we enter into act two of the Bible, which is the fall. Their eyes were opened. They now know good and evil. Their innocence is gone. They feel shame at their nakedness and they, and they make clothes to cover themselves up. What's the meaning behind this? Well, we could suggest something like this, that shame leads us to cover up our sin. Now, if we take all of this, what we just read, and we took time using this approach to say, okay, here's what we've, here's the context, here's what we've observed. What's the meaning of these six verses we've just read? Uh, maybe it could be summed up like this. The root of sin, because we've just witnessed the original sin, is failing to trust God and putting yourself in charge. 
Now, we're going to talk in a little bit about application, but I just want you to think about this. Think about how you could literally sit down and do devotions by yourself and ask, in what way am I tempted to not trust God? And in what way am I trying to put myself in charge? And you could begin to process that and apply it to your life. And so what I want to do next is I want to talk a little bit about posture. So we've, we've just read uh, six verses, we've, we've observed them, we've looked at the meaning, and now I want to talk about applying them and having the right posture. Here's a, here's a question we need to ask ourselves. Do I read the Bible to get what I want to get out of it, or do I come with a posture of trust? I guarantee you that when you open up this book and you start to read it for yourself, you're going to read some stuff in there that, that you're either not going to understand or it's going to be a problem for you, and the first thing you're going to want to do is ask questions like, did God really say that? You're going to be challenged by that. It's it's not a big deal. It's only fill in the blank. You're going to be tempted to think, oh man, you're missing out. God is just trying to keep you from something that, that is good for you. He doesn't want the best for you. This is the temptation to not trust him, to live your own truth. And I'll be honest with you, all of us at some point will be tempted to read the Bible and actually remove the parts that we don't like. Maybe some of you have heard of the Jefferson Bible. Thomas Jefferson liked to read the Bible, particularly like the words of Jesus, and he decided to build his own Bible. And what he did is he took a whole bunch of Bibles and he took a razor blade and he began to cut out all of the stuff he didn't like. And he took all the stuff that he did, like the moral teachings of Jesus, he took those and he cut them out and he pasted them all into another book and created what is now in a museum is called the Jefferson Bible. He he cut out all the miracles, all the, he just kept the morals and got rid of the miracles. And I think you and I will be really tempted to read the Bible in this way. Go like, ah, I don't like this part. I'll just take that out. I'll take that out. I'll just, I'll do these bits, but not those bits. And at the end of the day, when we approach the scriptures, we must come with a posture of trust. Why? Because the key to experiencing God through the Bible isn't technique. You can understand it through technique. But if you really want to experience God through the Bible, it requires trust. Uh, Let me demonstrate this for you. In Matthew chapter 4, we have the account of Jesus, okay, the Son of God. And after his baptism, he's about to start his ministry, he goes into the wilderness. Matthew 4 gives us uh, the story. It says, when Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. Now let me remind you, this whole book starts with Adam and Eve being tempted to mistrust God and not take him at his word and to doubt him. And now... Jesus, the new and better Adam, okay, the second man, he's coming and he's being tempted by the same character in the same way and he's going to pass the test for all of us. Just like Adam and Eve failed and through their failure brought sin and death into the world, Jesus is going to succeed in his temptation, give his life so we can have life and eternity. It's amazing. Okay, so Jesus is going to be tempted by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted and became very hungry. During that time, the devil came and said to him, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. Now, what I want you to understand, if you, again, if you open up your Bible and you read what comes before and after, four verses prior to this one, Jesus is baptized and the spirit descends upon him and a voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Four verses later, say four. Four verses later, Satan's like, did God really say that? It's like the same old tricks. It's the same deception. He's like, did God really? Seed of mistrust. Did God really say you're his son and beloved? But unlike Eve and unlike Adam, Jesus is not shaken by the question. The seed of doubt bounces off his heart. Jesus responds, no, the scriptures say. Jesus actually quotes the Old Testament. That would have been his Jewish and Hebrew Bible. Jesus doesn't give an inch. He says, no, the scriptures say man or people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus is like, I choose to trust God and what he said, I'm not biting. And two more times, Three times in total, Jesus is tempted. Did God really say that? God said he'd give you this, but I'll give you a shortcut. He's tempting Jesus. And each time Jesus quotes the scripture to him and rejects Satan's temptation. This is so important. Jesus didn't just teach the scripture. 
He trusted it as God's word. And not only that, but he models for us biblical authority. Jesus is like, I'm going to live by this book, and and I'm going to invite my followers to live by this book and the words that I say, to trust me enough to take me at my word. So the question is, how do I and how do you experience the Bible? It's one thing to read it. It's one thing to understand it, but it's something different to experience it. Because you can read the Bible and get a head full of information. And information is all about technique, right? Figuring out what it all means and all the connections. That's great. But formation is about trust. Formation is about trust. And, and you know this. Trust is, 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 the, is all about relationship. Trust is the, the root. It's the base of relationship. Like if every relationship is rooted in trust. And if you want to have a relationship with God... There must be trust. We must trust what he has said in his word. You see, we're talking about posture here. A posture of openness to the Bible allows you to experience the book. I'm open to what it has to say. I'm reading it. I'm asking questions. I'm observing. I'm looking for the meaning. That'll help you experience the book. But it requires a posture of submission and humility to the Bible. And that allows you to experience God for yourself to experience God for yourself. As I begin to wrap up today, I want to share with you a passage of Scripture that I've I've wrestled with for many years and thought about so much. And I want to share with you, it's found in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. And here the writer of Hebrews is talking about the Word of God. And that's, that's our theme for this series. Here's what he says, For the Word of God is living and active. This isn't a dead history book, friends. This book is living and active. That's why you can keep reading it. And different things pop out at it at different times. It's why you can read it and, and one time the Spirit of God will illuminate a truth and it'll change your life. It's living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. One of the powerful things about this book we call the Bible is that it will literally, it will literally pierce your heart, your mind, your soul, your thoughts, and it will discern between what is truly love and what is truly selfish motives. It will discern that as you open up the word and look at it like a mirror. It'll show you where you're in error. It, it, will, it will show you what is true and what is not, what is good, what is evil. As you read it, it will pierce asunder and it will shape you if you come to it with, an, with, a, with a posture of trust. You know, um, years ago, when I was uh, in grade nine, so 13, 14 years old, um, I was having pain. I've shared this story before, but I was having all this pain. And, and finally, I was complaining about it. My mom finally said, that's enough. I'm taking you to the doctor. And so we went to our family doctor, and he looked at me for a few minutes, and he had a panicked look in his eyes, and they rushed me into the hospital, and there they prepped me to go into surgery. I really didn't know much of what was going on, uh, but it was my appendix, and they didn't know until after they opened me up that my appendix had ruptured, and uh, which is, it can be a big deal, it can be very dangerous, and so I remember what it was like, though, to be on that, you know, I guess a gurney or whatever that rolling bed is, and I remember being wheeled down the hall in that bed and going towards the, uh, <laughs> the operating room, and I remember a feeling inside of me was going like, man, you need to run, like, you need to get out of here, this is not going to be good, and I went in there, and they put me to sleep, and I woke up, and they had taken some stuff out of me, and I assure you it wasn't fun, and I assure you that the healing process wasn't, uh, wasn't the greatest uh, time but had they had left that in me and not dealt with it, it would have been way, way, way worse. And, and I think for many of us, uh, we'll be so tempted when it comes to the Bible uh, to open it up and to want to you know, take out our scissors and begin to remove the things that we don't like or that offend us. But in reality, what we ought to do is come with a posture of humility. And instead of us surgically removing parts of the Bible, maybe we need to lay down on the operating table and allow God's word to penetrate our heart, to remove from us things that ought not to be there, things that are lies, things that are not true, bad attitudes, uh, all of these things. The word of God will sort it out like a two-edged sword and remove it from us. And so, uh, again, this is posture. I've shared with you some technique, right? We shared the coma method, right? Context, observation, meaning, application. You can do that as you read the Bible. And so what I want to do, encourage you as you go this week, 
is I, I want you to do these two things. I want you to choose a passage to read. And I want you to use this inductive approach that I've just shared with you. Before you read the passage, go, where am I in the story? Maybe read the beginning of the book that you're in and get a little bit of information so you have a frame. And then I want you to observe what you're seeing, think about the meaning, and then ask the question, what do I do with this? How do I submit myself to the Word of God so it can change me? So I want you to do that. And I want you to choose a posture of submission and ask God to speak to you. Now, I know this message series we've only touched. We've just touched the surface of how to study the Bible and experience it for yourself. But as I said at the outset, I really pray and hope that some of the dots have begun to connect for you, that you would do this, that you would open the Bible. And I'll tell you, nothing I'm sharing with you is going to help you unless you start doing it. And even if you do it halfway or if you don't even do it well, but you do it, you're going to start to grow and develop in your ability to read and experience God's Word. But most of all, it's important that we come with a posture of submission and ask God to speak. And here's one thing I know. Whenever we open God's Word and we ask God to speak, He speaks. He'll meet you where you are. And I I pray that this series has helped you uh, take steps in His direction. Would you join with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for every person listening to me online. I pray, God, that you uh, would speak through your word to them in the days and weeks ahead as we open up the scripture and we begin to, to observe what's there and seek to discover the meaning. Help us by your spirit to apply the things that we are learning and the things that we're reading to our lives so that we would be, that we would be wise men and women who build our homes and our lives upon a rock, which is your word. So God, thank you for every person. I pray that you would be with them as they open the scriptures, they would sense your spirit present, and that you would lead them and guide them into all truth. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.